folks. Um, and we will be recording here today just so that folks can, um, you know, just hear a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, and um, we're really excited to share with you some more today. We would love to have all of your questions, so, um, so please feel free to use the Q&A or the chat, um, and we will um, start, um, you know, getting to those um, towards the end of our um, time here today. And um, I'll be getting everyone out at one o'clock. Um, I know folks are always so busy, and we are really grateful for you joining us today. Um, and so we will be hearing from Kristen Micklebank, who is our Senior Manager of Research and Program Evaluation. Um, she has been with us for 13 years at the Food Bank. Um, which, you know, as I'm sure you know, um, having folks with that much knowledge and experience is so wonderful for any organization. So we are very lucky to have her. Um, Kristen has um, a BA and, and master's in geography, um, as well as environmental studies. Um, she's worked with the Children's Defense Fund here in Ohio, um, and Center for Urban Poverty and Community Development at CASE. Um, and just that, you know, experience and those relationships um, continue to be really impactful for how the food bank um, is also able to work with so many different community members and partners. So really excited to hear about that later on. Um, but yeah, Kristen, why don't you just give us a little bit of a background about how your role here has evolved? Because, you know, 13 years ago, Zoom didn't exist. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes. Um, so if you'd just like to share a little bit about, um, you know, your time here. Sure. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for uh, inviting me to do this today. Uh, you know, usually I, you know this, but usually I sit at my desk with my head buried in spreadsheets. So I don't usually talk to a lot of people during the day. So we'll, uh, we'll see how this goes. You and I chatting about uh, my time at the food bank today. But uh, no, I appreciate the invite and for getting to talk more about the work that the team that I work on uh, does. So yeah, like you mentioned, I've been here uh, 13 years. My role uh, initially was a planning coordinator. I started in agency services and that role came out of a strategic plan. Uh, the Food Bank takes their strategic planning very seriously. Uh, we spend a lot of time working on it and then that document really guides our work from year to year in terms of what we do. So the initial role uh, was to provide general agency services support like a lot of the other agency services staff members. So that meant going on site visits and helping with orders and troubleshooting any problems that agencies had. But the unique part about that first role uh, was to really look at the distribution of need in our communities and our six county service area, which for people on the call, if they don't know, it's Ashland, Geauga, Cuyahoga, uh, Lake, Ashtabula. Richland counties, let me did that a little bit out of order, but uh, those are the six counties. So what the need is in those six counties and then what our distribution of partners was. And it was really to look at the spatial mismatch between uh, those two things. So as a geographer, I was very excited and intrigued by the role uh, to be kind of looking at those changes and patterns and distribution and try to figure out how we could um, be serving more people, whether that be overall program locations or um, at the time, you know, I think when I first started, there were a couple of hundred food bank partners and we didn't do a lot of actual like produce distributions or programs tailored to kids or focused on seniors. Um, so really to kind of help think through like where with high levels of child poverty or senior poverty um, and kind of really tailor some of our programming to meet the needs of the community. Yeah, I mean, we have a really large service area, so I'm sure trying to match things up can be really challenging, um, especially, you know, if you don't have the data and the information, because, you know, so much of things that you see from, like, you know, the Census Bureau or something is it's it's big numbers, and it doesn't get down to, you know, who and where people really are. Um, so I can imagine that when we're talking about a thousand different program partners that we have, that trying to figure out where they are and who can get to them is really important and a really big challenge. Um, so I know something, and I'm going to experiment here trying to share my screen on a webinar. Um, I, I thought it was really cool. I love um, different ways to tell the story of our clients in our community. And um, you have put together... Um, so many great resources, um, but something that I really thought was um, fascinating was um, this map here, which shows um, where people are eligible for food assistance and where um, we have um, different programs. 
Um, and then I know there was a second map here that you had shared with me before. If I can get this to work here. Um, where we have different program partners. And I thought this was really impactful um, just to see a little bit of the scope of our work and you know where folks are also in the Cleveland area. Um, Cause you can see, you know, so much of the concentration of our partners, but also areas where it looks like there are, there's more need and maybe not as many partners who are able to serve um, folks. So um, I would just love to hear a little bit about, um, you know, kind of how you use the research and data that you've been collecting to then to help um, the food bank make decisions or help our partners make decisions. Sure. So uh, what we're looking at on this map is, the uh, American Community Survey, or actually this is the percent food insecure. So sometimes the background or the population who's eligible uh, for food assistance, which we're getting from American Community Survey estimates. This particular one showing the percent of the population that's food insecure. And that's something that Feeding America provides to all food banks across the country. And then we're just kind of um, overlaying our partner programs in Cuyahoga County in this case on that map so that uh, we can just see at a very county-wide uh, perspective um, areas where there are darker colors on the map, which are indicative of higher percentages of food insecure population, and then where the green dots are, which are uh, where the programs are located, just so we can kind of see, well, are there, you know, pockets or areas where we're seeing darker colors, meaning higher percentages of food insecurity, where we need to work to try to get some uh, programs located there, or at least make sure that we're reaching out to the people that live in those areas to make sure that they know about food resources that might be available, if not in their community but nearby or relatively nearby where they could go, people could go for assistance if they needed it. Yeah, and I mean, that's such an important thing that we don't talk about um, is, you know, you can have um, pockets where, you know, transportation is a problem or working folks not having programs um, at the right time of day. Um, so, um, you know, having, um, you know, this information and resources, um, you know, like I, I I know so if you if you look up here in the top corner, we've got our little Euclid pantry. Um, maybe do you want to share a little bit about how that decision, um, how like our our data and research kind of influenced um opening up the food bank's um new pantry at, at in, in the Euclid area. Euclid, ooh, excuse me, in the Euclid area because I know that your team was really impactful in helping to make that decision too. Sure. So uh, we have been doing for the last couple of years something called a gap analysis work. So again, it's kind of looking at that difference between need in the community. And this time, instead of looking at where the partners are located, it's looking at where people who are uh, receiving services are living. So we use a system here called Pantry Track. Um, it's kind of an electronic client intake system. And through that data, we know how often people are accessing emergency food assistance, which would be visits to in this case, pantry programs or different produce distributions, and then um, kind of how often they're going. So we kind of can, we can tell where people live also off from that. So we know where people live and where they're going. And when we were looking at that, we noticed that there was a big gap between the number of people who were being served and the number of people who were eligible for food assistance. Eligibility to go to a pantry program is 200% of the federal poverty level. Just for people out there, it's about $46,000 for a family of three uh, currently, and that changes and gets updated every year. Um, so we were noticing that there were big gaps in service between people who were eligible and people um, who were actually going. So Euclid was one of the communities that came up. So some other staff at the food bank went looking around and uh, trying to find a location in Euclid that would make sense. And then we were also very cognizant when opening that pantry to make sure that it wasn't competing with the other programs that were already in Euclid. Uh, serving the community. So we wanted to make sure that to your point earlier about the hours of operation, just to make sure that it was filling a void in existing hours and not overlapping with something that was already occurring. So it was a very cognizant decision on the part of staff at the food bank to make sure um, that it was filling a gap in hours. So not only a gap in like the location, but also a gap in the time hours of when uh, current partners were open and serving the community. All right. So it's exciting. It's been open since, I think, soft opening. And as of December of 2021, it's been open, in, you know, full time since January. It's open 
most days of the week, I think, except Sundays and, you know, not every Saturday, but some Saturdays during the month, every Monday through Friday, you know, hours there. Uh, and it's reaching a lot of people. A lot of people are going there and people that hadn't been accessing um, charitable food assistance before. So it's great that it was able to, to kind of start to fill that void and people who needed food assistance to be able to go there to get it. There's also a lot of different other services that are being offered there to try to um, help people and get them what they need. Yeah, the, the Euclid Pantry, we heard, we had a staff meeting yesterday and um, there have been over uh, about 12,000 unduplicated households who have been served by that pantry. Um, and I mean, it's just, it's really astonishing. I think about 20% um, are brand new to the food bank. Um, so folks who definitely did not have um, a really accessible resource for, for food assistance um, before we opened that. So I think that really just shows the impact that you know, doing that diligent research before making a decision can have to reach folks who really are in need and don't, don't really have other resources. So that's, that's awesome. Um, just to um, circle back a little bit, I know you said that, you know, most of the time, you know, you, you're, you know, at a desk and looking at spreadsheets, but I know when you started, um, you had a lot of experience going out into the field and actually pre pantry track days, um, you were, you were out with a lot of our partners. I um, want to share a little bit about um, that experience and kind of what that has led to now at the food bank. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, we currently are using something called Pantry Track. It was developed by the Mid Ohio Food Bank. It's an uh, intake software when people go to visit a pantry uh, program. And essentially, before it started, people, if I was going to go to a pantry, I would have a I have to sign in on a piece of paper form and say that you know, based on my family size, I was eligible to receive food based on the income that we earned. Um, and you would sign that form. And then depending on the pantry site, they would uh, store it every time you came and go through a filing cabinet and like look through it and find it or have a box or they would have, you know, A through C in one box and M through, you know, Q in another box. Every, system, every pantry just kind of had their own system for how they did it. Some would hold on to them for the year. Some would have a new piece of paper every time you came. Um, so it sounds like my house with a mess everywhere. Like the filing system made sense for the people who were there running it, but for everybody else, it's just kind of like, what are you doing here? You know? Um, so one summer uh, I had the, uh, was part of my goals for that year to go around to all of our pantry partners in our outlying counties. So every county besides Cuyahoga and visit the pantry partners and take those paper forms that they had and enter them into an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, because what we knew when we were, you know, agencies submit their statistics to us monthly. And when they do that for a pantry partner, they're telling us how many total people they served. And they're telling us how many adults, seniors, and children were in the household. And that was really all that we knew. So I live in Euclid, so I tend to use Euclid as an example, just because it's fresh in my mind. And I'm like familiar with the partners that are there and everything. But so if you went to a pantry in Euclid, um, they would submit their stats, but we didn't know anything about where people were coming from that went to that pantry. So were they coming from Lake County? Were they coming from Cleveland Heights or East Cleveland? Were they coming from Collinwood? We didn't know any of that information. We just knew that Euclid Hunger Center in the month of, you know, April of 2019 or whatever it was served this many people. And it was prior to 2019 when we didn't have pantry track, but that was just an example. Uh, so we would have that information, but not really know anything else about it. So as part of my initial project of going to visit all these pantries, the form also had your household address on it. So we could see then, well, if I lived in Burton, did I go to Middlefield in Geauga County for a pantry service? Or did I live in Eastlake, but go somewhere in Menor if I'm in Lake County? So it really gave us a much better understanding of people's um, kind of patterns of like where they were going for food assistance and how often they were going in the three month period that we looked at. Um, so I think, you know, I did that during the summer and we did like three months during the spring of when people were visiting pantry programs. So we could see how often people were going because of a pantry, um, the requirement is that they give a minimum of three days worth of food. But if you know, depending on your circumstances, three days might not be enough food uh, for you and your family to have an, enough food for what you need. So it might be, it's 
perfectly fine and that people would go to multiple pantries, you know, in different areas. I mean, there's no rules or regulations against that or anything. If that's what you need for your family to have enough food, that's what some people do. But we had no idea about that because we were just getting that one kind of aggregate count from that pantry um, that was submitting their stats and it was all kind of tied to the location of the pantry. So what this project really did is it helped us get a better understanding of uh, where you know, people were coming from, how often during a three month period they were accessing services. And kind of while we were doing this at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, you know, Mid-Ohio had someone who was a volunteer um, at a partner that went to a distribution and said, there's gotta be a better way that we do this. So kind of at parallel times, they were, you know, they had a volunteer that had some, um, you know, software development background. And so it was developing what we now call pantry track. So it was, it's exciting, you know, that it's scalable now. Pantry track now uh, is part of Feeding America and is available for food banks across the country to use if they are so interested to have this kind of information, to have better insights about the populations that all food banks are serving and get more in-depth knowledge just about how to serve populations um, in need better. Yeah. And I mean, that makes sense. You know, I could imagine, you know, a, you know, a family that has, you know, some teenagers in it will need more food than a family, you know, where the kids are smaller, you know, I mean, or I know different pantries can have different types of food. Um, so, I mean, I think having, you know, more information, um, it, it makes sense. Um, and also just, just a plug to all of our attendees, Look at the influence that that one volunteer has had. <laughs> it's something that they helped create um, that that we use, our partners use, and that Feeding America, I believe, they offer pantry track for free for food banks across the country. I've yeah, it is it is free. Um, it just kind of moved within the last year or so from the Mid Ohio Food Collective to Feeding America. But I think it just shows how much Feeding America is willing to invest in having like this kind of data that's consistent across across the network of 200 or so food banks across the country. Yeah, because, you know, as I've been saying, you know, since joining the food bank, so many people have seen, you know, the, the Muni a lot on the news, on the television. And, um, you know, for so many people, you know, hunger is something that they, they don't see every day unless you're in communities. And so I think one thing that Feeding America is great about doing is taking this information from, you know, from, from Cleveland and from mid Ohio and other places and really elevating the stories of clients. And that first thing you do is you just have to know who, who is really out there, where are they so that you can advocate for them and get the resources that people need. So really it's, it's, it's pretty amazing that it really did start with, you know, just a handful of people and where we are now. You have um, some, some team, a team member, you got a team I know of, three right now, I'm um, including yourself. And I know you've got someone who really works a lot with pantry track. Maybe if you want to share a little bit about how your team functions um, and kind of their roles, um, because it's like everything at the food bank, it takes a village. It does. And I feel very lucky. I'm sure everybody says this, but like, I feel very lucky with the team of people that I work with. Um, so they, like you said, there are three of us currently on that team. Uh, the I'll go kind of like by position and who they are and then talk a little bit about kind of as we work together as a team. But um, we have a data analyst on the team, that's Tessa McQuillan. Um, we have a outcomes and program evaluation manager, that's Stacey Hall and then myself. And then uh, sometimes we have the benefit of an AmeriCorps VISTA. That position is currently open. The last few years, it's a VISTA position that we've shared with the agency services team. Um, that Amanda Drager was in that position. Her year of service ended at the end of August. So currently we're looking to uh, fill that position. So if anybody on the call or member myself, who did VISTA after I graduated from college. It's an awesome program. And if any folks have folks in that kind of, you know, younger um, post-college, post-graduate kind of school age range, it, AmeriCorps is awesome, whether you're at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank or anywhere else. So just to, to plug in there that it, the VISTAs are, are awesome. It's a wonderful experience. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. To that's fine. It, we've had great uh, Vista, so we've been lucky at the food bank um, to work with people that are willing to serve for a year in that capacity. 
So it's been great. And then we report to um, Alyssa Glenn, who's our director of community health, nutrition, and measurement. And just for like organizationally or structurally, we kind of fall within the community impact area um, of the food banks team. And that reports to our chief programs officer, Jessica Morgan. So that's kind of how we're structured. Um, in terms of the day-to-day -day, uh, work, uh, Tessa in the data analyst role does a lot in terms of providing pantry track support to our partners. Um, so when a new partner comes on that utilizes pantry track, she'll do trainings with them. Um, you know, people are sometimes getting locked out of their pantry track account. They need their password reset or they just have questions about things. So she's a really great resource uh, for our partners to like help them with any questions that they have. Um, along the way. And then, you know, other things that our team works on is we have a portal um, that's used for agency services and program staff use the portal as well as our partners. So that's where any training um, that goes on, like that information gets posted there, forms get posted there. Uh, they sub that's where our agencies submit their monthly statistics is through that portal. So Tessa does also a lot of work in making sure that that's updated and up and running and working okay, and if there are any problems with that, she addresses those problems. So um, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on to make sure that we have good, accurate data, which personally, like I think is really the foundation of anything that we're gonna be doing. If the data that we're not working with is not complete and it's not accurate, we're not really telling the whole story, you know, because we're missing some data or the data are incorrect. So it's really important that all that behind the scenes stuff is like working properly so that we have the best data we can to use to make decisions with. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, bad information in leads to bad mm -hmm. decisions. So, um, you know, and I, in talking about kind of our, our partners, you know, I know that so many of our partners really work um, on shoestring budgets. A lot of them are 100% volunteer led. So I'm sure that kind of almost like customer service piece is really important to to help to help them you know manage like these these tech tools when they don't have the resources um because it's you know volunteer i know, i think something about 80% of our partners have less than a or like kind of agencies and partners have like a $2000 budget for food so they're very small operations so i can imagine um uh, that um this work is very helpful to help these smaller um, nonprofits that are out there getting food to the folks in need. Yeah, I think it's great that like the food bank is able to provide like those resources and provide that service. And then I think a lot of times too, we'll get requests from uh, the partners uh, for data and information that they've provided to us. So we do uh, partner dashboards for them, um, as well as, you know, a lot of them, like you said, they're small, so they want to spread the word about what they're doing to, you know, so whether they're writing their own grants or just putting something in a newsletter that goes out or in a church bulletin or in an annual report, um, they wanna be able to show the impact to the community and to their donors in terms of how many pounds they're getting from the food bank and you know how many people they're serving and at what cost they're able to do that at and kind of what the value is and if they're you know they like if they're good shoppers you know we can tell them what their cost per pound is um, through our inventory management system so there's just a lot of data that uh, we help them provide and I know some of them when they're applying for grants they'll reach out and say can you give us some information about need in the community um, you know, or can you tell us about where the kind of what we did for uh, the Euclid, you know, with the gap analysis in that community, like we've done that for our partners in the communities that they're working in, um, just because they're really thoughtful, I think, about how they can uh, serve their communities better. And we really couldn't do what we do here at the food bank without our partners. I mean, they just do so much to get people who, who are in need of assistance. Yeah. And, and you know, if, if you've worked at a nonprofit, you know, that um, kind of the 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 background, um, you know, it, the the you know whether it's you know admin, IT, research, um, these these are so crucial, like to help, like with that grant making, to help tell the story, and um, you know to explain impact in the community, um, and those are just resources that are just so hard to come by. That um, I think it's just it's great that we can help kind of bridge that gap for our partners. Um, I know you mentioned, um, you know, that you can do dashboards for our partners. I know you also do a lot of education internally 
with our own dashboards, our own service. Um, Cause I, you, I, I know I personally have sent you a lot of emails asking for things. So um, we've been talking a lot externally, but internally you also do a lot to help educate our own staff about our work. Um, if you could talk a little bit about, about that too. <laughs> Yeah, so we have an organizational dashboard. I feel with that project, uh, that goes out, gets updated every month. And I feel like I'm just kind of like the curator of information for that. Like a lot of those numbers, other people in the organization provide, we just kind of keep them on track in terms of like, this is a reminder, this is due in a couple of days, you know, and make sure that the numbers make sense from month to month, or if we notice any big jumps to make sure that that's like an accurate reflection of what happens. So we do that. Um, like I said, monthly. We also, um, there's just a lot of requests that come uh, for uh, grant reports, for uh, proposals, uh, meetings with donors. There might be, um, you know, donors in a particular neighborhood that want to know more about our partners in that area or what work is being done in that area. Uh, you know, we work sometimes during um, checkout hunger in the past. This is kind of a I don't know, it comes internally, but it's ultimately going to an external partner in the community. The past Heinen's grocery stores have asked to see who the partners are within their store location, you know, within like two miles of each of their stores, so that when people are checking out, um, you know, and being asked to donate to that campaign, that they can see like where their donation is going to have impact that pantry partners that are or other partners that are right near where the stores are located. So kind of sometimes it comes from an internal request, but it ends up going like back out into the community, uh, you know, internally for media requests or interviews that people might be having, newsletters, just any kind of information I think that can help tell the story. Uh, the team that I work with tries to provide that information to people just so that they have it so that we can let people know about trends and people being served or um, what we're seeing in different counties that we service or just what the need looks like or how the, any of that might have changed if we've added new partners any just any information that we have that can help tell the story um, about the food bank's work we're happy to provide that information yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I'm always thrilled to know that I, when I get questions, <laughs> I have your team to rely on <laughs> to get, to get things out. Um, again, like, like you said, you know, to, to tell our story, um, you know, and, you know, I'm, you know, we talked about, you know, you've been here for 13 years, but I'm sure that you've seen just an incredible amount of growth. Um, and then it, obviously, especially over the last couple of years um, and, you know, managing that you know, your team is now, we, we are so fortunate to have, um, you know, Alyssa working in our, you know, community health and measurement program. Um, but it didn't start out that way. I mean, these are some really new things that we've been able to do because our programs have grown so much. Um, and maybe if you could just give us a little bit of like that background of, of how we've grown and how your team has grown also to, to manage that informational kind of overload that we're, we've been experiencing the last few years. Yeah, so I think that, you know, initially, uh, like my own journey at the food bank in 13 years has been in a lot of different departments, which has been helpful to get a better understanding of the ways that different departments work, you know, but again, kind of going back to some of my opening comments about the strategic plan. So it seems that every uh, strategic plan, I tend to move different departments and kind of the way that the food bank is utilizing data and research and information and evaluation is kind of grown and continued to evolve and change. So, um, we are coming close to ending a strategic plan at the end of September. Uh, current, prior to our move underneath uh, community health nutrition measurement, we were in the IT area. And the purpose of that was really to kind of take people that were, you know, again, kind of like three people across the organization that were working on different things and put us all together and be working on, uh, at the time we called ourselves the data team. So we just kind of work on, you know, responding to these data requests and everything. Um, and the current plan that we're doing, that we're just finishing up, uh, program evaluation became more of a component that wasn't there prior to, you know, my time at the food bank really. So really kind of looking at the programs in more depth and doing some more program evaluation and outcomes work on, um, 
those particular programs. So I think that's one way that things have evolved a little bit. Um, and then also now we're really involved in a lot of different research projects with external partners that we weren't previously. So um, we're trying to rebrand ourselves a little bit internally uh, from being the data team to being the research outcomes and information team, uh, just to kind of more fully encompass uh, all of the different work and different things that we're working on. Yeah, because I know it is a lot more than than just spreadsheets, although I know Excel plays a big role in everyone's life on your team. Um, but I, you know, I, I think we talk about the rebrand. I think, you know, um, our one of our IT folks, Cash, um, had a little hand in kind of helping you um, ex expand your marketing of your team. <laughs> yeah, not uh, he was the main person that came up with the idea of, that we should be called the ROI team. So we give uh, Cash all of the credit for for that name. Uh, it's slowly like becoming more common, I think. It's a slow, slow process of switching people over from the data team to the ROI team. But we were the data team for over three years. So I figure it'll take it'll take a little while for people to get used to that. Well, and you know, that's a I think perfect segue into talking about, you know, program evaluation because that's kind of like um you know, kind of that that data and information piece to the next level, right? Because you know, people are kind of you know doing what they've been doing and your team doing some in-depth studies of our programs, it sounds like it helps kind of um, make sure that our programs are uh, not just like efficient, but effective. Um, and that we can also change and adjust some ways that we do things or offer suggestions to our partners, um, you know, based on that evalu I think evaluation sounds a little, a little scary, but it's not really like you're getting a test and a, a final grade at the end of it. Uh, so you want to maybe um, just share, a, you know, a little bit about um, what program evaluation is and then like how we're how we're using that to not just reach more people, but to reach people in better ways for what their needs are. Sure. So we um, in the strategic plan each year so far, we've kind of focused on different like programming example. So the first year we did a senior market evaluation and really like for us, what program evaluation means is we are looking at some internal data that we have just in terms of the programs and where they're located, what communities they're in, uh, how many people they're serving, how many pounds they're distributing. So a lot of that output kind of work that we had previously been looking at. Um, but then the outcomes work, we're doing more, um, doing interviews, doing focus groups, doing surveys to really try to get a handle on like how is their participation in a program making a difference? So are people more food secure because they got food from a senior market partner? Um, you know, and also we're interested in, you know, has their health and well-being improved because of that? Do they feel less stressed? Do they feel like their quality of life is improved? You know, we're kind of asking them some questions from some vetted surveys that are out there, questions that have been used previously. You know, there's a lot of work that's been done nationally. Feed America used to do something called a hunger study. They don't really do that so much anymore, but there are a lot of questions that food banks still want to know the answer to. And some of those have to do with choices that people make. So do people have to choose between food and medicine or food and housing costs or food and education or food and childcare, or, you know, food and whatever else they might be making choices. But so we ask questions when we're talking to people served at programs about that kind of thing also to try to get a better sense about that. Again, kind of going back to, well, what's the impact of us having a senior market program. So we did the senior market program one year. Um, and from that, we actually learned when we were talking to people that for some seniors, the quantity of food that they were getting didn't real, they were getting too much food for their household of one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so we needed to rethink kind of some of our distribution methods and amounts that were going out to some of the senior programs so that it was more in line with what would be appropriate for one senior living alone and what they could do. And we also heard during that evaluation, you know, that sometimes seniors have some health challenges. So it's difficult for them to hold a knife to chop a squash. Like that's hard on their hands to be able to do that or just a lot of food prep in general. So as we're getting ready to expand our kitchen with our move to um, the New Coit Road location, you know, that we are hopeful that there'll be some opportunities to kind of 
take what we learn from that senior market evaluation and prepare some, do some prep of food that would be helpful for um, seniors when they get it, you know, from our partner organizations or um, through senior markets or other distribution. So stuff like that that maybe we didn't know prior to is helping us to change a little bit, hopefully, about how we do our programming and make things more useful for the population that we're serving. Um, then this year we are doing a kids cafe evaluation, uh, specifically with the boys and girls club. So similar kind of thing, you know, we're looking at uh, the partners and where they're located and how many people they're serving. We went out and uh, visited the boys, some boys and girls club locations while they were serving. So that was a great opportunity for the team to go out and um, check that out and just kind of see how they operate and the meal counts and the service and you know, what other activities the Boys and Girls Club offered. So that was great. And then last year, the evaluation focused on our food as medicine work, um, specifically with the partnership with Metro Health. So we're kind of, you know, slowly but surely kind of visiting different program types and again, trying to figure out, you know, what's most effective, how can we serve the community better? Are there tweaks that we can make to the individual types of programs um, to just keep improving and making sure that like the food bank mission is fulfilled of making sure that people have the nutrition food they need every day. Yeah. And I mean, and without talking to people and, and asking them, you, you know, you end up making assumptions. Um, and I, I know I've, I've heard a lot about you know, the, the senior program in particular because it's not a one size fits all. And I think that something the food bank does a great you know, job at doing in general is trying to talk to folks and listen to them and then you know, make adjustments and having a wide variety of programs. You know, but that's you know, the kind of information um, you know, that, that you hear anecdotally, but it really helps to actually have some, you know, a, a, a real study so that when you're trying to change something, you can back it up instead of just saying, oh, I heard this from someone. And you can actually say, well, listen, we've taken the time to research and to, to do a thorough investigation of our programs um, because, you know, you have to, you have to, you know, move things that maybe people have been doing for uh, a long time in the same way. Um, so I think it's, it, it really helps um, kind of, you know, persuade whether it's internally or externally, you know, um, folks to kind of, you know, move in another direction. Um, and, you know, I've, uh, with the senior programs, I, I just, when I was volunteering, I heard someone say something about getting too much food, which, you know, you think is the opposite program, but, you know, our, no one wants to waste anything, you know, it's like they, it's like they would rather see that food going to someone else and shifting those resources in a way that makes more sense than just, you know, kind of making a, you know, um, kind of a, a very broad um, decision when it's, it's individuals. Um, so I think that's great. Um, uh, it, can you give us any sneak peeks about what you're seeing with the Boys and Girls Club so far? Or if you're if you're embargoed, I I won't I won't ask. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. We're we're still in the process of writing that uh, report up. I think uh, I can talk from just kind of my experience of visiting the program. Um, that I, I went to the Boys and Girls Club in Broadway, uh, and it, and I went with uh, Brandy, who works on the programs team, um, and just I think the relationship that the sites have with our program staff in terms of just how helpful they were, you know, like they couldn't they spoke volumes there. And Brandy was there with me, um, you know, but she just spoke they spoke volumes about just how helpful she is and how much like they value the partnership with the food bank the Boys and Girls Club does. And I think um, for me, something that was a little bit surprising is that food is secondary, it seems, to uh, families that are going to the Boys and Girls Club. You know, so they're there for like the after school programming and the family gets food, like the child gets food while they're there, but it's not that the food is like the driver of like why someone um, is going to the Boys and Girls Club. So it's just a, like a perk, a benefit of being there to, you know, basketball, they were playing in the gym. It was very common, you know, when I was there um, and they had like other gaming things and homework help and 
I had never been to the Broadway site before, but it was like very impressive just how they were organized. And they, I think they just opened a new playground this uh, summer. They had that in process while I was there and they had this whole gaming area for older kids. And um, it was just really thoughtful in their design, I think, of how they had it for the kids that were going there for the, the programming after school. So it was really interesting for me to see that, but also a little illuminating to see that food was not necessarily the draw of why um, the kids were going there. I mean, they were happy to get it. They loved their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That was like a very common uh, thing that came up. You know, they, they made that, oh, no peanut butter and jelly today because we were there during uh, the food service. So they came in and they got it. And um, so it was, it was worth it to go to the site to see it. Um, and Tessa also, you know, went out to see it and Amanda did and Miss Stacy also did. So people got to go out um, to different locations and just kind of see how those all operate. Yeah, well, I mean, that is that is really interesting about, you know, the, the Boys and Girls Club because, um, you know, food food is, you know, it, it's necessary. We all know it's necessary. But it's so that people can lead, you know, thriving lives. I mean, you're you you know, a kid cannot play basketball if they're hungry. They're not going to be able to concentrate on their homework if they're hungry. And it's and and so, you know, that it is really interesting because you know we're so focused on the food, but the food is to help people live their lives. You know, it and I, I think that's a really interesting way of just kind of reframing the 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 work that we're doing um that it it is a meal and you have you have to have it but it's so kids get to do all those awesome things that kids get to do um and you know in that i think that you know connects really with a lot of the the research that you've been able to do more recently um and your move into the the work um with health nutrition and research um, cause I know you've got several different major research projects and programs you'd be doing internally and externally. Um, I know with some of, you know, folks that, you know, at, at case, um, our nourishing beginnings program. So, um, if you could talk a little bit about, um, some of these bigger projects that are kind of reaching even, even more into what our community really needs th through using food, um, as, as a way to kind of build people up. Um, I know there's the, the Swetland work, um, Nourishing Beginnings, and um, I would love to hear a little bit more about that work too. Yeah, so I feel that the Food Bank's been really fortunate to be involved in some different research projects that are relatively within like the last three years or so. So for uh, we were involved with the Marianne Swetland Center for Environmental Health at Case Western Reserve University. Um, Dr. Darcy Friedman kind of oversees that um, center and she has a great research team and staff and students that are there uh, helping her conduct their research. So for about three and a half years, I want to say, we were involved in a project called Modeling the Future of Food in Your Neighborhood. And it just really looked at food systems and it had people um, with lots of different interests from all over the community and some other researchers from Ohio State involved and really looking at kind of, well, what is a a good food system look like and what are some aspects of that. So that was really interesting to be a part of that and hear so many different uh, voices and perspectives on kind of what's needed for, you know, anywhere really, but specifically Northeast Ohio to have um, a robust food system. Out of that work, um, I got to know Dr. Awusawa Yamwa, and we are actually working on a project that's having an event tomorrow. Uh, so good timing for um, all of this to occur, but um, that's very exciting. So Awusawa looked at uh, food security uh, and food access, essentially, and went to some of our partners, pantry partners um, within the city of Cleveland, and kind of had a different uh, evaluation tool and lens of kind of than what we do when we go on our site visits. So we'll be setting up a time for um, Alusa to come and talk to uh, staff at the food bank that work with our pantry partners to kind of see from her perspective kind of ways that maybe we could tweak some things at the pantry partners um, and improve some of like the work that we're doing there. But the really fascinating part about that research project from my perspective is she talked to clients and her research team, they talked to uh, clients that were served at pantries and did interviews with them and then also asked uh, 
those clients if they would be willing to take pictures of food access from their perspective in their communities. And so the event tomorrow is at four o'clock at the Martin Luther King Jr. branch of the Cleveland Public Library and University Circle. And it's really a photo exhibit uh, to look at what people, how they viewed food access within their communities. And uh, some of the participants are going to be at the event uh, along with their photos and captions that came through with the interviews. So um, I know I'm really looking forward to meeting people and to being in person um, and seeing uh, just like from their perspective, what food access means to them and what some of the challenges are and kind of you know, what food that they've gotten perhaps from the food bank and kind of, again, kind of what's that difference or what challenges do they still have to, to be food secure. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's been a great partnership. Um, Uso is also a geographer. So whenever I get to spend time with other geographers, uh, I'm always excited for, for that to happen. So um, that's great. So if people are free tomorrow and want to stop by the library again from like 4 to 5.30, anyone's welcome to Going up and see kind of more firsthand uh, from people who are being served, like their lens literally on um, how they're viewing uh, food access in their community. Yeah. So that will be good. Feel free to, to reach out to me um, via email if you would like some information. I'd be happy to, to share that with folks. I, I should have um, everyone's contact information and you should have mine, um, but I'll, I can put that in the chat also. Um, it, yeah, I'm, I'll be going to that. I'm really excited. Um, you know, just to to learn more about um, other ways that, that, you know, community members and community partners are kind of looking at food insecurity. Um, but something that you had mentioned um, and that I read about in the, the paper that you had done um, is the, the term nutrition equity. And I know that, that really relates to a lot of the work, the kind of more cutting edge research that's being done with food insecurity. I was wondering if you could just walk me through what nutrition equity means versus like food insecurity or hunger. Yeah, so the, as I mentioned, there was a really diverse group of people that worked on um, that project over the last three or so years. And uh, I'm gonna read the definition. I had a feel like, I didn't know that you were gonna ask me this, but I figure like if I'm talking about this study, I better have like the definition down. So I'm just gonna read that so people know how it was defined in the paper, but it was uh, having freedom, agency and dignity in food, tradi food traditions resulting in people and communities healthy in mind, body and spirit. So it is a little bit of a different way than I think historically, um, you know, equi nutrition equity had been looked at. And it was really a different term. And that study also said that, you know, for nutrition equity to exist, we really need to have economic opportunity, food security, and fair access to fresh and healthy food. So um, the food security is a small part, you know, of the larger food systems um, that that project really worked on. And it, it was exciting, the, the food bank, we were a co-author on that work um, that appeared in a paper in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So if anybody out there is interested, you know, we could also get them the uh, citation for that to read more in depth about the work that was involved in coming up with um, that paper. Yeah, I, I know that that makes sense. I know something that I've been um, hearing about is um, like culturally relevant food, right? So, you know, with with my background is there, there are sorts of, you know, produce or seasonings or flavors that are, might be different from someone from a different background. And it sounds like kind of that, that equity piece, like the mind, body and spirit, like that, you know, food means so much more to families and communities than just, you know, X amount of protein, X amount of carbs, um, that, that, um, that, you know, food speaks to people on a different, on a different level than, than just a bunch of nutrients on a plate. Um, so I think that's really interesting, um, that, that we're really thinking about food systems in that much deeper, um, and it sounds like more human way. Yeah. Um, and our, which um, kind of re relates to our, the next big um, project in terms of kind of equity, which is the Nourishing Beginnings Program. Um, I know that 
that's, you know, very new and really getting to some very important food related health issues um, involving um, kind of um, maternity health issues and inequities um, with maternal health. Um, and I, you're, I know you're involved with that. Um, it sounds really, um, really important. And I, I would just love to hear a little bit more about that um, program and where we are and what we're hoping to achieve with that research. Yeah, so Alyssa is Alyssa Glenn here at the Food Bank is really the one that's like the lead um, on that project, but it's a very collaborative project with the Food Bank, with Case Western Reserve University, Better Health Partnership, and First Year Cleveland. And the idea behind it is to work with community health workers um, to get uh, nutrition to pregnant people with the hope of improving like birth and health outcomes. And so there, not to get into like too much of the research nitty gritty details, but uh, when people sign up to be involved in the project, they're kind of placed, we're calling them into like one of two um, areas. So they're either going to be getting a food box from the food bank, or they're going to be getting a uh, cash. And the idea is to kind of see, well, what happens um, in those different situations and scenarios in terms of it does one, um, do more to improve the health of the child, um, the mother um, in that process. So just kinds of looking at that. We just started enrolling people into the project probably within the last month, five weeks, something like that. So there are a few people that have been enrolled into each of the different um, sort of like research study groups. And so I know that people have been getting the food boxes already, and then they're asked to fill out some surveys once they do that. And then to your point earlier about making sure that people get the food they want, there are some surveys that go out in the beginning to ask people if they have any allergies, food preferences, what kind of food they would like to see um, coming from the food bank in that box of food they get. Uh, we're also helping provide them with some kitchen tools in the beginning um, to make sure that people have access access to, you know, some kitchen tools that would be helpful for them, as well as getting different kinds of nutrition resources. So information about um, perhaps other food pantries to go to, or just other places in their community where they can get healthy food, uh, kitchen equipment, like I mentioned, and just other nutrition info about how to cook and eat healthy. So it's a very exciting project. I think it's supposed to last also a couple of years and really um, hopefully provide some great insights on um, maternal and child health. Yeah, which, um, you know, is is a really big problem in the Cleveland area. Um, you know, it's really shocking statistics about um, kind of those poor health outcomes. Um, and it's a lot of it is driven by by nutrition and, and food. So that sounds really amazing work. Um, I'm glad that we're able to that we have the resources to be able to work with those partners on that because um, it's, you know, the reason why we work in partnership is because we can't do any of these projects alone. Sure. <laughs> it's all intersecting. Mm -hmm. um, we are getting close to the end here. So if folks do have questions, um, you can put those in the Q&A or in the chat. And also, if you think of a question later on, you know, please also feel free um, to email me and I can I can um, find things out. So, you know, this is this will not be the end of our, our conversation. Um, I do see a chat here um, about um, you know, considering how diverse the Cleveland community is. Does Pantry Track also track food preferences of pantry guests like gluten free, dairy free, kosher, halal? Um, yeah, so if you can talk a little bit more, I guess, about the, the details of what we try and capture from our client information. Yeah, I do believe uh, so. It's kind of like a, each family has a like a for lack of a better word, like a record in pantry track. So I believe that like those preferences um, could be listed on there so that when someone were to go sign in at a pantry program, that would pop up, say that this family doesn't eat pork or they're vegetarians or, you know, they are lactose intolerant. So that that is available to do that. I think the degree to which that happens just kind of depends on the pantry partner itself and how much information um, they take, take down. I know some pantries will uh, take a household has children in it, they'll write down like not actually just that there's a child, but they'll keep track of the age, like the actual birthday of the child. So if the family's coming in near the birthday, they'll try to have, you know, something there for the child to help celebrate their birthday. So a lot of that is really dependent on kind of what the 
individual partners do. But yeah, that type of information, it is possible to record there. Yeah. And again, nothing, none of that information was captured before, you know, you were able to start working on all this, you know, data research, program evaluations, outcomes. So, I mean, it, it makes a difference. I mean, you can imagine, you know, um, how amazing that would be as a kid to come in and, and get something special for your birthday. Um, and I, I, I will also add, you know, we do have, um, some program partners. Um, we, we work with, um, the coaster food pantry. Um, we have, um, partners with um, the local Muslim community. Um, so they have um, halal food. So we do try to do that, but obviously there's always more that we can do to make sure that um, our, our clients and families then um, can get the, the types of food that they need. But again, that all starts with getting the information. Um, and, and until you get that, you can't then meet the need the way that folks really need that, um, uh, what, they, what they really need. Um, all right. So I, you know, I, um, for anyone who's been on these before, you might remember, um, Kristen Glazer used to be our kind of moderator facilitator and her favorite question, um, was always to end with, um, you know, what your biggest takeaway or most impactful story or experience at the food bank has been. So Kristen, if you'd like to just, if you have any, an, um, any special stories, memories, um, something that has been really impactful and has stuck with you to just hear a little bit about that. So I'll approach that, I guess, from like two different uh, aspects. So one, I think just in terms of like one of my takeaways from being at the food bank is just how the food banks continue to evolve and like grow over my time here. You know, I think there's, as we've talked about a lot during the last hour or so, just a lot more emphasis on research and evaluation and data and kind of using all of that to inform the decisions that we're making in like support of our mission. So I think that would be, you know, in terms of like from my perspective and the work that I do here every day, I got a takeaway. Uh, in terms of a uh, story, I'm gonna save this, like we're saving this for the end and I hope I get through it okay because it's a little emotional uh, story for me to tell. Um, and I think, you know, when I was in agency services and part of one of my favorite parts about being in agency services was going and doing site visits. I think, you know, as you mentioned, it's like a lot of our volunteers are, uh, are a lot of our programs are volunteer led. So it's people just doing what they do to serve their neighborhoods and their communities because it's important to them. And they wanna make sure that people have food that they need and they have a place to go for a meal. So I remember that I was, um, it's been a while since I've been in agency services, but it's still like something that sticks with me, this uh, experience. So I was at a hot meal partner and we were doing, you know, all the regular things like show me your, how your kitchen looks and is the food stored properly and are you keeping your temperature logs and do you have your invoices and all of that kind of thing. But you really, I think, sometimes get to know the partners when you're talking to them and they're often, you know, very proud of like what they're doing and the services that they're providing to the community. So I'm sitting down with a contact and just kind of out of nowhere, she starts telling me about her childhood and how she had siblings and her mom would sit them down for dinner and they would put, you know, their placemats on the table and her mom would come around and give them dinner, which sometimes would be sugar. And that that was all that they had to eat and that she got very emotional kind of telling me this story and saying that, you know, sometimes like that that was all they had and that their mom did the best that they could, but they just didn't have food to eat. And so, she runs this hot meal program because she wants to make sure that other kids don't have to experience that and that people never have to worry or wonder about where they're going for food. So I think probably people in agency services and programs that do a lot of site visits have a lot of stories like that, but that's just something, you know, probably this was more than eight years ago that I was like on this site visit, but it was just such, it just, I don't know that like she felt comfortable enough to like tell me about that, you know, and that wanted to share that like that's why she volunteers to run a hot meal is so that people don't have to have sugar for dinner. Yeah, um, it's, you know, I all of us have a role to play. And even though, you know, you don't see that every day. I mean, those are the the people and the families who I know you're you're ultimately helping. Um, and it's it's really incredible. Um, you know, everyone who is on, um, you know, this call today, um, you know, all of our supporters, you know, you really are making a difference. Um, you know, 
for that program, that hot meal program, all the families that they serve and for all of our other partners and clients and um, community members. So I just wanted to thank everyone again um, for being here, for all of your support. Um, and uh, we will be having um, our next Food for Thought um, on October 13th. Um, we hope to see you then. Um, but, you know, there are lots of ways to get involved, volunteering, um, you know, our advocacy efforts, um, just, um, you know, so we are so appreciative of your time and your energy. Um, and thank you to Kristen for joining us today. Um, I know you are busy. And so taking this time out of your day is um, really, um, you know, we're so grateful for that and, and for everyone here and all of our community members helping us get nutritious food to the folks who need it every single day. Um, so thank you all. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. And, um, and if you're available tomorrow for the event at the MLK Library, we'd love to see you there too. All right. Take thank care. You. Bye.